Hi, my name is Janie Studemond, and I am honored to be Huntington Hospital's board chair. I've been associated with the hospital for over three decades and served on the board for 20 years. It has always been one of my life's greatest honors to be on this board. And yet I have never been more proud of the Huntington Hospital team during this hyper-challenging COVID pandemic. Starting in early March, our Huntington team of physicians, nurses, managers, and truly everyone across the hospital mobilized quickly and intelligently to take care of our community. Just several of the ways in which this is done have been ensuring that we have the right PPE or personal protective equipment and technology, which many in the nation have not been able to have. Adding ICU or intensive care unit beds and frontline teams to respond to the increase in COVID cases. Making sure that our emergency department was staffed to handle the large influx of patients. And at the same time, continuing to deliver babies, have operations in our hospital, help seniors and provide flu shots, all of which we have been doing for decades. All of this has required the Huntington team to work tirelessly and around the clock seven days a week. This has been a Herculean effort. Honestly, the team's level of devotion is truly awe-inspiring for all of us on the board who are fortunate to have a front row seat for what it has taken and will take for the hospital to fight this pandemic. We could not be delivering this excellent level of care without grateful patients and generous community members like you. You have been incredible in your support of the hospital and we thank you tremendously. As we all know, this COVID pandemic is likely to continue for some time. Moreover, there will be additional challenges in healthcare. At Huntington Hospital, we stand ready to confront all of them and do our very best. We hope you will continue to support our hospital. Also, we want you and your loved ones to be safe. So to be sure to wear a mask, wash your hands, practice social distancing and get a flu shot. In closing, we have one other suggestion. Please watch this information packed video by Huntington Hospital's very own infectious disease expert, Dr. Kim Schreiner. I have known Kim since she was in college and she is a true star. She will give some excellent advice about COVID during this upcoming flu season. Kim was just named a healthcare hero by Business Life Magazine, and she is also recognized on national public radio as being one of the foremost experts about COVID. Thank each of you so much, and let's turn it over to Dr. Schreiner. Um, I would just like to thank uh, all of our patrons and donors uh, for all of the support that you provide to Huntington. Um, I'm sorry to say that I am back after six months for a second discussion about COVID, uh, but uh, this is the reality that we have to deal with. I would just like to, to make a comment um, about the uh, care that um, uh, and uh, uh, services that our, house sta that our staff and our nurses and uh, physicians and clinicians, respiratory therapists, EVS people provide at the hospital. Uh, it's really remarkable. Their, uh, tenacity and ability to really uh, provide excellent, excellent care after eight months of this is, re is just an, a tribute to their commitment to our community. I finally would also like to uh, really um, compliment uh, the leadership provided by our vice presidents at the hospital and particularly Dr. Morgan. She is an incredible CEO. Uh, we couldn't do this without her and I think she has really created an environment at Huntington that's innovative, nimble, and able to respond to a very, very serious and challenging time. I was asked to uh, do a lecture on the convergence of COVID and influenza. And uh, so I'm going to take an opportunity to kind of review both of these viruses and how they may interact with one another, uh, but also to, uh, to remind us of just how serious this pandemic is. 
Um, as you can see what's happening back east right now, um, we are really in the middle of a very big surge. Uh, we've been very fortunate in California to thus far not have too much of that experience right now, although we did have a surge over the summer. Uh, but I think we do need to be prepared and realistic that that could also happen to us. And I'll uh, spend some time on uh, reviewing how we can protect ourselves and our families. So currently the COVID situation worldwide is very, very challenging indeed. This is a brand new pathogen. Um, none of us on the planet ever had encountered this before or nor had any immunity. And uh, eight months into this pandemic, we now have uh, over a million deaths around the world and um, uh, uh, almost 40 million cases of virus. This number continues to grow. And as you can see from this slide, um, the uh, pandemic is everywhere. Uh, some countries are affected more than others. Certainly the United States has had a very large burden of disease uh, and it continues to be a very big challenge for our country to try to get this under control and to um, uh, evaluate uh, effective methods of decreasing the number of cases. As of uh, yesterday, there were um, over 8 million cases in the United States with 220,000 deaths due to COVID. Um, the people who don't d uh, die from this disease, who survive from it, many of them go on to have what appear to be some chronic problems. So this is a very important and lethal pathogen. Uh, and although um, we are, uh, uh, of course, most concerned about individuals that are hospitalized, uh, we do know that many people who get COVID uh, continue to have symptoms even well after the infection has resolved. So it's a very challenging disease as clinicians, and we're uh, really trying to kind of get a handle on how this virus behaves. This is a very unusual time. Uh, in some respects, the good news is, is that the entire world uh, and many, many different um, specialties and uh, parts of science, whether we have basic scientists, virologists, clinicians, epidemiologists, politicians, healthcare strategists, um, and the general public are really converging together to try to get this pandemic under control. So it's a very interesting time to be an infectious disease specialist. Um, and I would like to certainly recognize all of our colleagues in other fields that are trying to desperately come up with information about this virus uh, so that we can develop effective therapeutics and perhaps most importantly vaccines. Um, as I mentioned, although the rest of the country is currently experiencing an enormous uh, surge in this disease, with up to uh, 60,000 cases in one day, uh, which occurred last week. Um, LA County is holding its own right now. There's been just a little bit of an uptick in the number of cases in the last couple of days. We've got about 289,000 confirmed cases uh, with almost 7,000 deaths since the beginning of uh, the pandemic here in Los Angeles. But we have experienced surges before, and so it behooves all of us to sort of watch what's happening back east and try to um, understand the ways that we can protect our communities and protect our families so that we don't experience the same. One of the serious problems that's happened in the United States uh, with this second surge, which appears to be happening, is that that's built on top of a very high density of disease to begin with. Uh, when you have an enormous amount of communities already infected and affected with uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, the virus that causes COVID-19, and then you add more cases on top of that, that's an incredible bur burden for healthcare facilities. And you can see that some of the hospitals and uh, healthcare facilities back east now are beginning to have really substantial problems in terms of managing these patients. They are having to utilize the surge tents and so forth that we have, uh, uh, we have packed away but ready to use if we need to uh, at our own facility. So uh, that's why the situation currently is so very serious. You see the same thing happening in Europe uh, some of this is a function of the rather um, uh, opening up of society during the holidays and in, in August and September when many people in Europe go on vacation. They bring the disease back into their families. Uh, it circulates in the, disease, in the families and then uh, causes um, illness in those that are most vulnerable. So that there's always this delay between opening up society for activities that are high risk and then the development of disease. Uh, as we move through um, the uh, infect, infectious period of the, of the virus. You can see right now uh, that, again, the East Coast and the Midwest are really experiencing a huge rise. Also, the north uh, uh, middle portion of the country, North Dakota, has had an incredible number of cases. So rural areas are not spared uh, with COVID. Uh, the virus doesn't care whether you are a suburbanite, an urbanite, or a rural, rural person. It's just looking for another host to infect. And so when you have large uh, events with large gatherings, uh, some of the um, motorcycle uh, events that happened up in Sturgis, South Dakota, uh, those lead to what we call super spreader events, where the virus spreads very quickly 
And then when people disperse across the country, they bring the virus back to their community. <clears throat> so it's very important uh, that we try to understand how the virus spreads so quickly uh, so that we can develop some modalities to prevent that from happening. Uh, this, uh, these are some data that we keep very close track of at Huntington every day. Dr. Morgan is given a, a running, running uh, count of the number of cases that we have, uh, the utilization of our ICU beds, uh, the number of uh, patients that are uh, on, up on our COVID cohorts. And you can see that right now we are experiencing a slight lull, which is good news. Um, we anticipate to have to deal with more disease perhaps in the next few um, uh, months. Uh, but we need to try to um, get uh, under control in terms of uh, where this is going to go. If we do see signs of a surge, an increase in cases very quickly, uh, then that will be a signal that we need to begin to mobilize some of our resources. As Dr. Morgan said, we do now have a rather permanent COVID uh, cohort ward, and we also have, um, of course, our intensive care unit right now. We can expand that if we need to, if we start experiencing more cases. Uh, Pasadena right now is also having a relatively low number of cases, although there were nine new cases reported yesterday. So that might be the beginning of uh, a little bit of a trend upward. We'll have to keep a very close eye on it. We're very fortunate in our city to have our very own uh, health care uh, public health department run by an excellent epidemiologist and physician, Dr. Ying Ying Go, and we worked very closely with them uh, for all of our management of COVID disease in, in and out of the hospital. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, influenza because, of course, as many of you know, this is the beginning of the influenza season, and there's been great concern about how these two viruses will behave together. Um, we had a little bit of experience with that when uh, COVID was first beginning to spread at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. So in late March, excuse me, late uh, February and early March, when we were seeing some cases of coronavirus, influenza was circulating widely at that time. Um, that last year was actually quite a bad year for influenza. We had an H3N2 variant, which is a more uh, a nastier version of influenza, if you will, circulating, and it was causing a lot of uh, hospitalizations and problems. But you can see from this slide that uh, as of um, about uh, early March or so, we began to see this dramatic decrease in the number of cases of influenza as we were beginning to recognize that we had a coronavirus pandemic. And that's probably due to the lockdowns and the issue in, issuing um, encouragement of people to socially distance at that time. It probably sort of put to rest some of the circulating influenza that was, was moving around. This has some importance as we look forward to uh, what may happen in the next few months in terms of controlling the uh, effect of influenza on top of a coronavirus pandemic. And we also can look to the Southern Hemisphere, which of course experiences their influenza uh, outbreaks usually before we do. And what you can see from these uh, graphs here in Australia, South Africa, and uh, I think it was uh, someplace in South America, uh, basically is that um, there was very little influenza. If you can see along here, just pretty much baseline uh, this uh, during this the last few months of the summer, which of course is the winter time in uh, the Southern Hemisphere, unlike uh, previous years when we saw lots of cases of influenza in those areas. So that's sort of good news that when countries uh, have mask mandates and people practice social distancing, that not only does it decrease the circulation of SARS-CoV-2, but it also decreases other respiratory viruses, including influenza. So we might take some comfort that maybe, just maybe, this won't be a very bad year for, the, for influenza. However, that being said, we know that that virus, in conjunction with SARS-CoV-2, can be very, very problematic, and so we do need to take uh, appropriate precautions with regard to the flu. Uh, so these are sort of the factors that seem to be associated with the decrease in influenza in 2020 in the Southern Hemisphere. Again, the pandemic lockdowns probably contributed to that. Some of the countries like Australia and New Zealand had very strict lockdowns. They continue to do that, and they actually have quite good control of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic in their own countries. Um, there may have been a slight decrease in influenza testing as we were trying to ramp up testing for coronavirus, um, but uh, that probably wasn't as much of a factor. Children were at home. They weren't at school. We know that schools are a very common place for both influenza and SARS-CoV-2 to be spread, uh, as in addition to other respiratory-borne viruses. Uh, so the, having the kids at home may have decreased the amount of uh, sort of the, the stew pot, if you will, of viruses that can cause infection. The use of masks and social distancing and perhaps, and perhaps most importantly, the decrease in international travel. 
That's largely how influenza moves around the globe is on airplanes uh, or cruise ships. Uh, and so since those um, activities have really been curtailed by the COVID pandemic, uh, maybe that's decreased also uh, uh, the risk of influenza. Uh, but what does happen when pandemics collide? Now I will tell you that there's still a pandemic going on right now that very much is involved with SARS-CoV-2 and that's the HIV pandemic. Uh, HIV, um, of course, is a very different virus than SARS-CoV-2, uh, but the pandemic with, with uh, HIV continues, and one of the things we're worried about is how does SARS-CoV-2 act in HIV patients. Um, so we've been very uh, watching that very carefully, some interesting findings that I can discuss later, perhaps. Uh, and also, uh, the other issue is mobilizing antiretroviral therapy for patients to continue to maintain control over the HIV pandemic. Countries that are experiencing uh, economic issues <clears throat> associated with the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak are now also not perhaps as um, amenable to providing support for other countries that need HIV medications. And so we may see some sort of collateral damage with an uptick in the HIV pandemic. Um, <clears throat> so influenza, of course, we know is a very effective pandemic pathogen. And we reviewed this actually in our last lecture um, with, with regard to the 1918-1919 Spanish flu uh, pandemic. And it was largely thought that the next pandemic probably would be an influenza pandemic. But unfortunately, it's turned out to be a SARS beta coronavirus. So um, we know that, that this virus, though, influenza itself can be a pandemic pathogen. And so it is a, is a very important virus when it comes to mortality. If you look at the 2018-2019 flu season, there were 35 million illnesses and about 34,000 uh, deaths. So it's a, it's a significant virus that uh, obvi obviously impacts hospitals every year, even when we have uh, really good acceptance of uh, flu vaccination. Of course, uh, the COVID-19 um, uh, epidemic now has uh, created even more disease, and um, that's built on top of what we know influenza can do. So it is a, a, of concern. So if you compare these two uh, pathogens, um, uh, there are some similarities, but there's also some important differences. We know that influenza is a droplet-borne uh, virus. In other words, you get it by inhaling droplets from someone who has influenza. We are seeing increasingly that SARS-CoV-2 is, a, of course, a droplet-borne virus, but perhaps more importantly, it does have the capability of becoming what we call aerosolized. And what aerosolization means is that micro droplets, little tiny droplets, less than, than uh, one micron, uh, can actually float in the air under certain circumstances, indoors, uh, lots of people unmasked, uh, activities such as yelling, singing, uh, ex exercise, um, or even the humidity of the room, and certainly ventilation in the rooms may affect the risk for aerosolization. Uh, that's why outside is always better than inside. That being said, we also know that aerosolization can occur outside and lead to infection, and I think the events of the Rose Garden event a few weeks ago speak to that type of transmission. We know that the two viruses are both very infectious, but SARS-CoV-2 is infectious on a whole different level. Influenza is a very infectious virus. Um, it's likely to cause infection in a, if an infected person is likely to infect at least one or two other people. SARS-CoV-2, it's more like three or five other people. Uh, so it's a highly infectious pathogen, uh, and perhaps more so uh, than the flu. Um, the uh, uh, dynamics of infection with both of these viruses is a little bit different. People are most infectious with influenza when they're symptomatic. And we thought that was going to be true for SARS-CoV-2, but what turns out is that people are perhaps most infectious just before they're symptomatic, if they become symptomatic. We now know that um, people can be asymptomatic. They may not have any symptoms, or their symptoms are so minor they don't even notice them, and yet they're highly viremic and they're, they're highly infectious. And that's why this virus is so dangerous. You don't know when you're standing next to somebody who could be shedding virus. They may not be coughing. They may not have a fever. They may not look or feel sick. And yet they are highly infectious. Uh, we know that the incubation period for influenza is a little bit shorter. It's about one to four days. That for uh, SARS-CoV-2 is anywhere between two and 14 days. Most of the time it's between four and five days for SARS-CoV-2. The risk factors are very similar. The difference would be um, that uh, uh, things like obesity play a much higher role in uh, people having a bad outcome with uh, SARS-CoV-2, although it is a risk factor in um, influenza. Children typically get pretty sick with influenza. They don't seem to get as sick with SARS-CoV-2, but they are very effective spreaders. So um, the, the idea that children don't get the disease, um, they may not get the disease, but they certainly can get the virus and they can spread it to other people. Um, 
The clinical manifestations of the two diseases overlap, fever, uh, achy bones, uh, cough, uh, headache, uh, but uh, influenza tends to be a little bit more of an upper respiratory kind of congestion, uh, sore throat, that sort of thing. SARS-CoV-2 can do that, but it also has some peculiar symptomatology, such as a loss of sense of taste or smell, which is often a very first um, a side or, uh, symptom. Uh, it also can cause a very severe fatigue, sometimes gastroenteritis. It does affect the GI tract, so there are some differences. Uh, and then the fatality rate. The fatality rate for influenza is about 0.1%. That for, for SARS-CoV-2 can be anywhere between 02 and up to 20%, depending on the population that it's in, affecting. Elderly people with comorbidities, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, um, those folks can have a much higher mortality if they get very sick with um, SARS-CoV-2 compared to influenza. In terms of the diagnosis uh, of the two diseases, we do have very accurate testing now for both of them. Uh, that's called polymerase chain reactions, or PCRs, where we can actually test for the presence of virus. And we now have PCR assays that can test simultaneously for both influenza and for uh, SARS-CoV-2. We do have that nasal pharyngeal type swab at, and testing platform at Huntington, and so that will be very helpful for our emergency physicians when they have someone who presents with an upper respiratory infection. Is it flu? Is it SARS-CoV-2? Is it both? Um, the uh, antivirals uh, for influenza are pretty good. We have oseltamivir, Tamiflu, that can attenuate the disease itself, help people, people make people uh, less symptomatic and also probably less infectious. Um, and there are some other medications we can give if they're hospitalized. Uh, there really are not very good antivirals for SARS-CoV-2. Remdesivir, which I'll mention in a little bit, uh, is a possibility, but it is not very effective um, in the long run on mortality. And finally, a vaccine, and I'll spend some little bit more time uh, dealing with that uh, in, a, in just a bit. So a few weeks ago, Dr. Fauci was asked, what is your nightmare scenario? And his response was, this is it, because we're dealing with a virus that's met all four criteria for that nightmare scenario, and that is it's brand new, none of us have any immunity, it's respiratory born, it's easily transmissible, and it has a significant degree of illness and mortality. And that makes for a very severe pandemic pathogen. So SARS-CoV-2 is a highly infectious pathogen. It spread very quickly around the world. Really within a few weeks, every country was infected. There's a very high density of disease. There's a higher density of disease now than there was when I first gave this lecture. So that makes it much more challenging for, uh, for communities to try to get it under control. We know it can cause serious illness regardless of your age. The adage that it doesn't make younger people as sick is true in some respects, but it also uh, can, we know it can uh, be very damaging in, in young people and can actually kill them. Um, it is transmitted through some of the most casual interactions and behaviors among people. Nobody has any immunity, really, for any purpose uh, for herd immunity. There's no robust therapies, and uh, right now we do not have a vaccine. With influenza, we know that there's different types that circulate that may be nastier than others, and I mentioned the fact that the H3N2 tends to be a more virulent type. That's what circulated last year, and we saw quite a bit of disease at the hospital before we sort of got hit with the COVID business. So um, it was a, a significant pathogen. It can cause a high degree of uh, illness and often mortality. Um, the influenza antigens um, uh, uh, that are triggered uh, can create an immune response so people can develop immunity. But influenza changes very quickly. Every year it's different, and that's why every year the, the flu shot is different. Uh, the other big difference is that um, although bats clearly can get SARS-CoV-2 because that's where this virus came from, uh, other animals don't seem to, to get it. Uh, there's been some concern about mink. Uh, the mink industry, I think, has taken a hit. And there's been a few anecdotal cases of cats and dogs that have gotten it. Uh, but influenza is pretty common in other animals, especially uh, pork and swine. That may be an area where the virus replicates and changes. Certainly birds, um, cats. This is a Maine Coon. I have a Maine Coon. Um, and occasionally whales, which the idea of a whale with the flu is sort of scary. But um, there you have it. So what's the viral structure of these two pathogens? Coronavirus is called coronavirus because of these spikes that are around uh, the virus itself. As I mentioned, this is a beta coronavirus. The source of the common cold are alpha coronaviruses. This is an animal virus. Uh, jump species became much more virulent. And the most important part of the coronavirus is the spike protein. This is the protein that allows it to attach to human respiratory tissue. And it attaches very avidly. And that's really a very important part of the pathogenicity of this virus. 
There are three other types of proteins that are important, and those may be something to look at in developing vaccines. But for right now, the spike protein is the one that has, has our attention. Influenza also has things on its surface membrane. There's four types of influenza, A, B, C, and D. A and B are the ones that are human uh, pathologic and cause seasonal epidemics. Influenza A is usually the one that's the most common one. It tends to occur in California uh, a little bit later than it does on the East Coast, partly because of weather. Uh, people move indoors a little bit sooner on the East Coast. Uh, and we often don't see our big flu outbreak until usually February or March. Um, but most of the time, the, the nasty player in, in influenza outbreaks are A, but we do occasionally see B later in the year. And these little spikes on the, on the surface of the influenza protein are what we make um, the flu shot from. Uh, so that's why they have this terminology of, of N's and H's, uh, because that's the, the antigens that we use. So how are these viruses transmitted? Well, both of them are droplet-borne. And then I mentioned the fact that uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 can be aerosolized. And that makes it a much more dangerous virus, behaving much more like other aerosolized viruses like measles or even tuberculosis, a bacteria. Uh, we know that occasionally contaminated surfaces, you touch a surface where there's actual live virus, you touch a mucous membrane, your nose or your eye, uh, that can cause contamination and infection. And that's why we want everybody to wash their hands, to try not to touch your face and your mouth, uh, and to wa wipe off surfaces, especially telephones and computer uh, terminals, because those are high touch areas. Turns out you touch your face anywhere between 35 to 50 times a minute. Uh, hopefully people are not doing that now, but the temptation is always when you talk about it, you want to scratch your ear or touch your eye, uh, but that is a potential way of inoculating yourself. Some of the infectivity for both of these viruses is dependent on how much virus you're exposed to and the time of the exposure. And that's particularly true for SARS-CoV-2. Um, so the longer you're in a room with somebody with COVID, uh, the more likely it is that you can become infected. And this uh, slide basically looks at the type of um, droplet distribution that can happen when you uh, cough uh, or when you sneeze or even when you exhale. And we know that for SARS-CoV-2, even some of these smaller things, just breathing, can create a lot of aerosolization and infected particles. The reason why this pathogen is so infectious is that it's already undergone a mutation. In the early part of the pandemic, we had the Chinese version of um, the mutation, excuse me, of the virus circulating largely in the west coast of the United States. And that uh, underwent a transformation at some time when it passed through Europe and uh, developed a different mutation that allowed it to be much more infectious. And so it's this G614 variant that's circulating now. It's highly infectious. Um, it wants to go to a, a non-immune host, uh, and that's why it's causing so much disease. We know that most transmission occurs in households, uh, and these were, uh, this is based on extensive studies done mostly in Korea and Japan, um, that um, non-household contacts in this one study was only about 2%. Household contacts was upwards of around 11 or 12%. And that households that have school-aged children, that would probably include college-aged children, are more likely to have transmission at home. Multi-generational families, congregate living situations where you have lots of people living in, in a small space or even just in a home, those are areas where high transmission can occur. And unfortunately, even in our facility, we have had many multi-generational families that have come in simultaneously uh, and have been uh, had to hospitalize some of them in the ICU together, which is really a, a tragic um, issue. So the risk factors are for transmission are the situation, your likelihood that you're going to encounter somebody who's actually infected with either influenza or SARS-CoV-2, living in congregate living situations, nursing homes, college dorms, multi-generational houses, lots of people in the house, crowds, uh, the duration of exposure, and the inoculum size of the virus um, that you may be exposed to. Somebody's highly infectious, they have a very high viral load, you're standing next to them, they're talking loudly, and that's how you can get infected. We know the host has risk factors, their age, their occupation, healthcare workers, first responders, uh, people on the front lines, grocery clerks. Um, those folks are at high risk for uh, encountering this disease, obviously, uh, but anybody can get this disease. So whatever your occupation is, if you are around lots of people all the time, especially unmasked people, then the risk is much higher. We know that this, both of these diseases affect lower socioeconomic uh, communities much more disproportionately than they do uh, higher socioeconomic communities. So these are target areas for vaccine distribution and for really getting the message across about how to protect yourself. Um, and we know the comorbidity issue with diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and so forth. 
Uh, as I said, most of the transmission of SARS-CoV-2, however, is coming from asymptomatic people, and so you really can't identify somebody who could be um, somebody who's carrying COVID. Well, how do we reduce transmission? Um, <clears throat> so the most important thing are what we call sort of mitigation techniques, and we know that masks really make a difference. Uh, they not only diminish the amount of droplets that are dispersed, they protect you, uh, but they also protect you from other people. And so the more people that are masked, the less likely you're going to have droplets being um, exuded that can cause disease. The uh, type of mask is important, although even some of the simple cloth masks are pretty effective at preventing transmission. In the hospital, most of our clinicians, certainly when we're engaged with patients with COVID, are wearing N95s or more sophisticated masking um, equipment. Um, but uh, even a cloth mask out in the public is helpful to diminishing transmission. So that's clearly a very effective way of reducing transmission. We have a very effective vaccine for influenza. The influenza of vaccine is safe. It does not call, cause the flu. The reason people say it does is because we give it during flu season. So it's just, it's possible that you encounter influenza before you go down to get your flu shot. And so that's why people think they get the flu from the flu shot. But the flu vaccine cannot give you influenza. With the exception of one variant, they are all killed vaccines. They're very, very safe. And they're very effective at diminishing the transmission and also the severity of flu. Some people may still get the flu if they've had a flu shot, but it'll be, it will be a much la less nasty version uh, than if they didn't get vaccinated. And so basically anybody over six months of age should get a flu shot. And if ever there was a time to get a flu shot, this is the year to get the flu vaccine. So I hope all of you, if you haven't been vaccinated, you go out and get a flu shot. It's an easy, safe, highly effective way to protect yourself at least from one virus. I won't go into the details of the uh, different types of vaccines. For those individuals older than 65, we do recommend a high-dose influenza vaccine. Most of the vaccines now are quadrivalent. They include both types of A and B. Uh, so you're pretty uh, safe in whatever you get. Uh, there is a live vaccine that's used largely in children. Uh, we don't use that in adults or people who live with immunocompromised people because they actually may shed influenza virus. But the bottom line is, is that almost all the different vaccines that are available at any grocery store and also, or sorry, any pharmacy, some grocery stores, uh, and also uh, being provided by Huntington Hospital are very safe, effective vaccines that will protect you from influenza and protect your family from it. So uh, basically, this is what I've already described, that the vaccine should be administered largely by the end of October or November, but if you haven't had a flu shot, go get one. You can get them as late as January and they still may protect you. Again, we hope that this isn't going to be a bad flu season because people are conscious of viral pathogens now, uh, but I think it's important that you get vaccinated anyway because you don't want to get the flu. Well, how do we prevent SARS-CoV-2? That's a much, much bigger challenge. Obviously, we know that social distancing works. We know that six feet is sort of this magic number because that's about as far as respiratory droplets can, or large respiratory droplets can move. Now, again, with aerosolization, we may have more people getting infected uh, as these micro droplets float through the air. But six feet apart is probably a good thing to do. For your Thanksgiving gatherings, if you can keep people six feet apart uh, while they're eating, when they have their mask off, that's a safe thing. If you keep the number of people down so that you don't have large gatherings, you maybe have five to eight people, but not 10 to 20 people, that will help protect you. If you can have your a holiday celebration outside, we live in California, we have wonderful weather, looks like we're gonna have a dry year, unfortunately. This might be the time to have the outdoor uh, Thanksgiving in, in plain air. Um, so those sort of things can protect you. Uh, but we know that staying, staying away from people at least six feet uh, really does prevent transmission. I don't know why masks have become so controversial because they're such a benign thing and they are so effective. Every time we see people that start using masks, we see the amount of disease go down. It protects you, it protects the people around you, um, and they're very, it's a very easy thing to do. They're inexpensive. We now have lots of masks available. Uh, that was a problem at the beginning of this pandemic. Uh, but even just a simple cloth mask is effective. Surgical masks are good. N95s for those in high-risk situations are very effective. And there's a very interesting uh, added benefit of a mask it may actually allow you to be exposed to just little bits of virus. And that may produce something called variolation, where you actually are exposed to a pathogen, um, but in tiny, tiny amounts that won't elicit infection or disease. But maybe that's going to tease your immune system a little bit, and it, you might have some protection. 
Very interesting um, article that was published in the New England Journal a few weeks ago that proposed that, and the way that masks, the dynamics of masks, the way they behave may provide that. So that's another reason to wear a mask. Uh, gloves, you know, gloves are sort of a mixed bag because you still can touch your face and so forth, and they're, you know, washing your hands is probably more important. Obviously in the hospital we're wearing gloves and gowns, and then we have very sophisticated equipment in rooms where people have uh, coronavirus and there's aerosol aerosolization events. Uh, this basically just is a study that was uh, published in Science uh, early on that again showed the effectiveness of masks, both in protecting you and protecting the community. Uh, this is a study that looked at uh, communities that had mandated mask orders and they had a much, much lower incidence of disease. It probably saved hundreds of thousands of lives. And I think in some of these states where masking is really not very uh, common, that's why they're really suffering the consequences of, of COVID right now. Uh, this is a nifty little study that I like to quote a lot because it looked at different types of masks. Here's the N95s down here, very effective at preventing transmission of droplets. But you can see that even some cotton, polypropylene, <clears throat> and other kinds of masks are pretty effective. <clears throat> Excuse me, bandanas and uh, fleeces and gaiters are not as effective, but they're better than nothing. Uh, so uh, any kind of mouth and nose covering uh, can really protect you. And of course, washing your hands. Dr. Morgan was commenting the other day that I think we have about 90% uh, compliance now with good hand washing. I've never seen so many doctors wash their hands so many times, but it just is a joy to see. So uh, the dreaded Amazon package on your front porch. Um, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, all of us were probably taking a large stick and kicking it in the door, or trying to not touch it. Uh, that's probably not a common transmission modality, but it is prudent to uh, let something sit there for a little bit, let it kind of cool off, maybe use some gloves when you open the outside box. Uh, wiping down all of your groceries and doing that kind of stuff, I think, is maybe not necessary um, unless you just really, it helps relieve some anxiety. But this is not a common transmission mode, although it is well documented and can occur. Perhaps the most important thing in preventing the spread of this disease is if you feel sick, stay home. Don't go to work. And this is something we really try to drive home to our staff. Uh, medical people are very committed to taking care of their patients, and they want, they want to go to work. <clears throat> Doctors are notoriously bad in that department. But right now, we're really encouraging people, if you feel sick, do not come to work. Outdoors is always safer than indoors. I talked a little bit about this in terms of the holiday thing, and we're lucky that we don't have a really cold climate. Um, this was during the 1918 pandemic, so they even then knew uh, how to protect themselves. I'm not going to spend too much time on the pathophysiology. It's very interesting. It's very scary. Uh, I think for people that don't believe that COVID is a serious disease, they should spend a day in our intensive care unit. Uh, it is a very bad disease. It, it causes a great deal of distress for patients. They are literally drowning in their secretions. They can't get uh, ox oxygenation. They may have cardiac abnormalities. It does affect, affect many organ systems, including, the, of course, the heart and also the brain. And some of these areas may be problematic even after they've recovered. Uh, there is a post-COVID uh, syndrome that we're beginning to see. So it's a very challenging thing for physicians to deal with, just in terms of supportive care, because that's really all we've got right now. We do have some interesting modalities coming down the pike, uh, but even remdesivir is not a, a game changer when it comes to treating this disease. Uh, this virus really likes to screw up the in immune system, and it does that by activating and dysregulating the immune system in a very complex way that we're just beginning to understand now. Uh, so it really can cause a lot of calamities, including emboli, which are little clots that go off, causing stroke or bleeding, uh, and it can uh, affect really any organ in the body. We've talked about all the risk factors that, can, uh, that put you at risk. The blood type thing is sort of interesting. Um, I, there is some early data now that's suggesting that type O blood may be slightly protective. Type B might be protective. Um, type A maybe has a worse prognosis if you get COVID. Uh, that has to do with the proximity of those uh, antigens on the um, uh, chromosomes near uh, immune modulating genes. Uh, but I will tell you that I've seen patients of every different type of blood type uh, in the ICU and on the wards, and so it doesn't hold true for a lot of cases. Uh, this is the bottom line when you get COVID, what your lungs can look like. You get this kind of strange peripheral sort of pneumonia. It's very typical for COVID, and sometimes the whole lungs can just entirely wipe out when they have rapidly progressive disease. Uh, these are all the organ systems that are affected or infected uh, with this disease. This is a lung of a 29-year-old. Uh, she underwent a lung transplant. Uh, you can see that just a terrible damage that occurs uh, in the lung. It's hard to know that somebody like that could oxygenate effectively. She ended up requiring a, a double lung transplant. 
Uh, this is just a, a little um, diagram that show, sort of shows that during with, with SARS-CoV-2 that you're asymptomatic within the first zero to five days, but you can easily spread the virus. The symptoms usually begin by day seven or so, but they may not be very significant. You may not even notice them. That's when we begin to see the antibodies, your own immune system, begin to try to fight it off. And it may do that pretty effectively, or it may not be able to do it. Uh, and then we know that people maintain um, some uh, important immunity uh, afterwards, but we don't know how long that immunity lasts. And that's going to be important in terms of the development of a vaccine. We have many more testing modalities now than we did when last I spoke to you. Um, but we still are uh, having some problems with um, the ability to access these, especially in large quantities, to test teachers, to test students, to test uh, workplaces, to test the hospitals. We need a fast test uh, that's highly accurate, uh, that's inexpensive, and can be done um, uh, for everybody without requiring PPE for the person gathering the test. So those are going to be challenges uh, going forward. But we are working on some of those. The Yale just released a saliva test that looks very promising, perhaps something we can do at airports where you spit into a cup. Uh, they do the test, it takes nine minutes, they find out you're COVID negative, you get on the airplane, and that may allow a little bit safer travel. So testing is going to be a very important part of trying to open up society more effectively. Um, there really aren't very good therapies for either of these pathogens, although influenza does have a few antivirals that work pretty well. You have to be very careful about um, uh, the snake oil salespeople that get out there and profess cures when there's not been any studies to validate that. When you're dealing with the pandemic, it's very important that you provide care for your patients, that you take some chances in terms of trying novel things, but that everything is done with the patient's safety and benefit in mind. That just throwing anything at them that might be dangerous or deleterious is not good medicine. And um, it's very important that you follow the science with this disease. So with COVID-19, uh, basically the disease itself, uh, we provide ventilation, supplemental oxygen, uh, the antiviral remdesivir doesn't work terribly well, but it does decrease the hospitalization days in people that are fairly not super sick. That's probably the most utility. Anti-inflammatory drugs like dexamethasone, uh, which suppresses some of the infl inflammation. You saw that used um, a few weeks ago in the president. Convalescent plasma has looked promising, but it isn't a game changer either. Uh, and then some of the supplemental medications, vitamins and so forth, those may help, but and certainly don't harm people. Monoclonal antibodies. Uh, may be promising. Uh, the president received Regeneron, uh, Regeneron's monoclonal antibodies, uh, but they are still in clinical trials. They have not been approved. Influenza has the two medications, uh, neuraminidase inhibitors, and then also there's another one called amantadine, and of course we have a vaccine uh, for that particular virus. There are some data now that are coming out that may show some pre-existing immunity to SARS-CoV-2, uh, and that has been well documented. There are lots of coronaviruses that can cause disease, Perhaps there's a little bit of overlap, but given the <clears throat> enormity of the pandemic in the United States, that probably is the exception rather than the uh, rule. We also know that when people get COVID, there can be some post-COVID uh, sequelae. And this is sort of the long haulers, or people that have persistent symptoms even after the infection has apparently cleared. And that's going to be a very interesting population to study. There may be permanent uh, side effects that happen with people that are on uh, on uh, that have COVID, but we're just going to have to see how that goes. And finally, I want to end a little bit with vaccines. As you know, right now we have five big clinical trials going on in the United States looking at uh, vaccine uh, development. And a lot of people have put a lot of stock in whether vaccines work. Uh, this is the data from uh, the rhesus monkey studies that were done early. This was a DNA vaccine. They vaccinated 35 monkeys uh, and then rechallenged them with um, SARS-CoV-2, and it was effective. Uh, that uh, immunity seemed to last for about six weeks, but we don't know whether that's going to last for six months, and that's going to be a very important criteria for an effective vaccine. Uh, these are the different types of vaccines that are currently uh, preclinical and clinical development. As I said, we've got about five big trials right now. You've probably heard of some of these companies. Moderna has a, an mRNA vaccine. That's probably the farthest along. That's the vaccine. Uh, that Dr. Fauci is involved with. Uh, AstraZeneca has a, an adenovirus vaccine, a killed vaccine platform. Uh, they are uh, up and running again in Europe, but they did pause that um, a trial because of some bad uh, side effects and it's not been reinstituted yet in the United States. Uh, and then Pfizer also has an mRNA vaccine. Novavax and Sanofi are a little bit uh, farther behind. But this is sort of the stages of development that we can see in a lot of these vaccines uh, where they're coming along. Uh, so we may know 
by the end of November, perhaps early December, some of the uh, initial results from these big trials. Uh, this is some of the data for the Moderna vaccine. does seem to elicit a good neutralizing antibody response, but we don't know the duration of that response. If it only lasts for six months, it's not going to do us much good. Uh, this is the data from the AstraZeneca uh, chimp adenovirus vaccine. It shows good neutralizing antibody response and good cellular immune response. This may be the game changer for long, the long-term haul uh, for uh, protection against SARS-CoV-2. But vaccine development is still challenging. When you think about it, most of the time it takes about five or six years to bring a good vaccine to market. We still don't have a, have a vaccine for HIV 35 years into this pandemic. So to develop a vaccine for a brand new pathogen that's going to be effective and protect the entire world is a huge challenge. And I really applaud the pharmaceutical companies and the scientists that are trying to work so hard day and night to get this to happen because it's going to be a very, very important part of our ability to control. So um, I want to just talk a little bit about herd immunity because you have talk, uh, heard about this a lot lately. Uh, herd immunity is when the population itself has enough immunity that the virus really doesn't have anywhere to go. It, it goes from Fred to Sylvia, but Sylvia already has antibodies, so the virus just ends at Sylvia. Um, that is a very hard thing to achieve with this virus. And you may have heard about certain uh, groups that want to try to promote, just take your mask off, let the young people get sick, we'll protect the elders, and that's how we're going to get out of this uh, pandemic. That would be an, a, a humanitarian catastrophe. Um, the amount of people that would get sick and die from SARS-CoV-2 would be in the millions and millions and millions. And so that really isn't a practical way to achieve herd immunity. You can see that it didn't happen in Sweden. They did try to use that modality. They had a much, much higher mortality than Denmark and Norway. And they also had a much lower GDP. So in terms of using that as an argument for economic benefit, it really doesn't bear out. The way we achieve herd immunity is through an effective vaccine and effective mitigation with masking, social distancing, testing, isolating people, good contact tracing from epidemiology, uh, our, our epidemiology uh, people, and that's how you achieve herd immunity, which we can do if we pull together and follow the science. Uh, but in the meantime, we have to sort of move along and uh, try to be practical about this and realistic, which brings us finally sort of to the holidays. Everybody wants to get together. Thanksgiving is a really big holiday in my family. Uh, uh, but it's important that we pay attention to what's going on around us. This year, 2020, is not the year to have a, a large family gathering for the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, Halloween. Uh, what you need to do is to come up with something creative, whether it's a virtual holiday, whether it's just a few people that perhaps have been tested, uh, or a few people that you trust. Uh, where they can stay six feet apart, and when they're unmasked, when they're eating, uh, that they are not close together. You provide uh, buffet stations or pre prepare each individual meal so that they don't have to infect uh, uh, a table of food. Uh, and you really just think about it very, very carefully. It might be great to have a great Thanksgiving holiday with your family. It would be a catastrophe to have the elder members of that family die of COVID three weeks later. And so I think that's really what we have to think about when we, when we go forward with the holidays. This is not the year to have the big celebrations. Maybe in June or July, when we've finally gotten over the hump, if the vaccines work and we really have this thing under control, that's the time to have a Thanksgiving and be thankful for what we've achieved. But for right now, it's not the time to get a large gathering. Please try to be thoughtful about who you're inviting and what their risk is. So staying healthy during the winter of 2020-21 is get a flu shot. Go out and get a flu shot. Wear a mask. Practice social distancing. Weigh your risks. We all have to do things that are risky. Go to the supermarket, go to the post office, but try to weigh those in terms of what you're going to do that day. Stay informed and follow the science. Look at reliable sources for this disease. Be creative, be thoughtful, and be patient, because we will get through this, although it is an enormous challenge. And I'll end with the picture that I think I may have showed you at the beginning of my grandmother during uh, the 1918 pandemic in San Francisco. Uh, where they still had the same technology, and it worked for the most part uh, at that time. So I'm happy to take some questions. I think they're coming in now to uh, over the internet here to my references. Any questions?
Maybe I covered everything so thoroughly you don't have any questions. There's a 25 Sorry? 25 delay. Oh, there's a 25 second delay, okay. Uh, somebody asked me about air travel. I can answer that question a little bit. That's not a question here, but that's a common one. If you don't have to fly or go by train or bus, don't do it. If you have to, then be very, very careful. I think it's prudent, of course, to be masked when you get on an airplane. Bring hand sanitizer so that you can wipe down your seat. Uh, Dr. Morgan was just telling me about some new invention, sort of a sheet sort of thing that you can put on your seat. Uh, so you need to try to uh, be very careful, not just when you're on the airplane, but when you're in the airport and uh, when you're in the boarding area. You all get sort of crammed on that gantry. That's where everybody's very close together. We know the virus can spread over through the aircraft, and so you have to be very, very careful. So if you don't have to travel right now, don't do it. But if you do, then try to be very, very careful uh, as you do it. Looks like New York City, very few kids in the school have contracted virus. Thoughts about this and kids returning to school? A very good question. Uh, they have done some very good mitigation in New York, a lot of testing, lots of messages about uh, social distancing and masking. Uh, so I do think that we can begin to do some of those activities, but you have to have those pieces in place. You have to have a community that wants to protect themselves. Uh, you have to uh, be very careful about how you start it up. And if you see problems emerging, then you have to shut it back down again. New York has done a very good job with this. I think they've been very um, thoughtful about uh, trying to uh, create an environment that's safe for their kids. I know that the LA Public School District is looking at testing now to begin thinking about bringing their schools back online or offline back into the classroom. Uh, but I think that all those pieces really have to be in place. Community involvement and engagement, people practicing safe distancing and mitigation, testing, and then retesting uh, in those situations. That really is the most effective way of preventing transmission. We know that uh, other schools have had terrible calamities with bringing kids right back and not doing any of those things. So I think we have to really pay attention to how uh, we bring children back uh, into the classroom. Other questions? How will the vaccines under development address possible further mutations? <clears throat> it's a very good question. Uh, most of the vaccines are directed towards, if not all the vaccines, are directed towards the uh, spike protein. Um, the way the vaccines are designed is that they, um, uh, some, some vaccines, the mRNA vaccines and the DNA vaccines, uh, inject sort of some genetic material that stimulates the cell to make neutralizing antibodies. That's the first part of your immune response and then hopefully those will activate the cellular part of your immune response down the road. Um, other vaccines are, are what are called killed virus vaccines where they take the virus and they just kill it and you inject that. The Chinese have been using that uh, quite a bit. And then there's carrier vaccines, the chimp adenovirus vaccine that Astra AstraZeneca has. Um, all of those should be able to compensate if the spike protein mutates again, uh, but that is a concern. And that happens, of course, with influenza very quickly. Now, influenza is able to change many parameters of its surface proteins quickly from year to year. This virus doesn't seem to do that, but it does uh, seem to be able to change the spike protein. If there's a large enough mutation in the spike protein, then no, the vaccine may not be effective. And so it is important to look at many different types of platforms for vaccine development. And I will say that the uh, pharmaceutical companies that are involved in this, with possibly the exception of the Russians, uh, have been quite transparent about uh, trying to make sure that everybody understands what the platform is and how it works. They also actually are making the vaccine right now. The idea is, is if they get a good result in the next few weeks, then those vaccines will start to be distributed probably in January and February. Um, but we hope that the different platforms and our understanding of the disease will help guide sort of um, sort of fine-tuning of vaccines as we develop. Right now what we need are vaccines that are pretty effective that can really diminish the amount of disease. But I think going forward over the next many years, of which there probably will be outbreaks of SARS-CoV-2, that we can fine-tune those vaccines a little bit so that we can uh, control the disease even better. But it is a concern and it's something we're going to have to watch very carefully. I want to just mention, too, that uh, UNICEF, you may have seen in the news, just ordered 500 million syringes 
Uh, they will be under the guidance of WHO uh, guiding the uh, global distribution of vaccines. And so I think that um, they'll be, uh, the organization of vaccine distribution is going to be very challenging. Some of these vaccines require two shots. The Moderna Pfizer, both Moderna and Pfizer vaccines require two shots. So that's going to be challenging to make sure that the second shot is the same uh, company as the first. What is your best guess for how long it will take to, take to reach herd immunity? So um, if we have an effective vaccine and we have an organized and well thought out plan for distribution and we get a large portion of the globe vaccinated, I think it may, may, may not take that long. This virus um, is pretty quickly extinguished if it doesn't have a host to go to. So um, it, unlike HIV, which is a latent virus, we don't know when people are infected and that can last for a lifetime. This virus, if it doesn't have a host to go to, it's going to drop off. So if we get a very wide distribution of vaccine uh, uh, development and uh, distribution and inoculation and utilization, then we should probably begin to achieve herd immunity within a few years. Uh, but I think it is reasonable to expect uh, small outbreaks, perhaps even the occasional large outbreak, uh, when it touches populations that haven't been vaccinated or that have no uh, existing immunity. What's been the effect of delayed screening for cancer, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera? Very good question. And Dr. Morgan's been very concerned about this at our own facility that uh, people are not going to their primary care doctors. They're not getting their routine screening tests. Um, and I will tell you, just as an infectious disease physician, we are seeing people that come in with more advanced diseases, whether it's cancer or even things like the rotten gallbladder that sort of sits there and festers a little too long because people were afraid to go to the hospital or couldn't go to the, see their doctor. So that is a concern and we're trying to address that. There's a lot of pressure on hospitals to try to uh, really uh, work in tandem with this pandemic and that's what we've been trying to do at Huntington is to open up as much as we can to get our operating room fully functional again so that we can try to uh, address some of the diseases that have backed up, if you will, uh, during this pandemic. Uh, the other issue is really the um, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, the global situation with distribution of essential drugs like HIV medications, childhood vaccines throughout the world, uh, tuberculosis medications, those sort of things have all been put on hold <clears throat> in large part because a lot of the companies that, uh, countries that supplied support for underserved countries are not able to get the medications there. So that's another collateral damage, if you will. <clears throat> uh, Nick says, uh, adversity often breeds invention. Are there any positive developments that have come from COVID? Absolutely. Um, I just was at a lecture earlier this morning with Caltech, um, who is doing amazing electron micro microscopy, looking at SARS-CoV-2. The amount of science that's, being, uh, that's coming out right now is just incredible. And if you look back at what happened during the, and continues to happen during the HIV pandemic, we understand the immune system so much better now. We have medications for all kinds of diseases, not just infectious diseases, but all kinds of cancers and modalities that we never would have known if we hadn't been dealing with something like HIV and now this virus. So I think that the science that's coming out of this pandemic is incredible. I think healthcare policy issues, socialization issues, uh, social injustice issues, equity, humanity, uh, the importance of protecting our environment, uh, the importance and fragility of our globe, uh, all of these things, I think, are really coming to people's attention now, and I hope going forward that we pay attention to this so that we can really create a better environment for our own species and all the species that inhabit the planet. You mentioned inner household families are at risk. How can we help mitigate catching COVID while living home with others that leave for work or gatherings? So uh, it's important that we try to uh, encourage people to think about what they're doing, uh, to wear a mask, of course, whenever they can, uh, to be transparent about their activities. Uh, if they think they may have been uh, in some sort of risky situation, then perhaps uh, have decreased contact with family members for a few days to make sure that they're not becoming symptomatic. Um, to really take ownership of the responsibility that they have, not just for themselves, but for their family members. Uh, we've had a few cases where we've had families uh, that um, young people have come home from school or something and they've infected the family and then there's been a, a terrible tragedy in the family. And that's a, a legacy for uh, other family members to have to live with. So remember that if you get COVID that you're not just affecting yourself, but you may spread it to someone who's going to have a far uh, worse course and may even die. And so it's important that people take some ownership of their behavior and are transparent about it. 
Little kids are actually pretty receptive to wearing a mask and being careful. I have two little twin kids that are next door to me, and I'm always impressed with uh, they're out riding their bikes, they've got their masks on, uh, and they're very um, attentive to that. So I think uh, children can learn from adults setting a good example, and you can protect your family if everybody is on board. Any more questions? It's possible. Um, uh, the, the getting, getting schools back up and running for the second semester is going to be challenging for colleges and for uh, certainly for elementary and high schools. Um, the, the issues, again, as I mentioned, and why New York has probably been successful is that we need to try to uh, have a testing platforms that we can use frequently um, to make sure that the environment that, that teaching is going on are uh, safe for transmission, preventing transmission. They're well ventilated. Uh, outdoor classrooms if possible, uh, that the teachers in those classrooms are not people in high risk groups that have a lot of comorbidities, uh, that we have a way of uh, contact tracing if somebody does become sick. Those are all the techniques that we can use to try to begin to open things up uh, a little bit. And I think it's going to be challenging for schools, but I think with the availability of testing platforms that are quick and accurate, uh, which are becoming every day more available, I think that will really help them in terms of uh, getting that under control. I think also we've had a chance to see what, when we can't control it, what happens. And some of the really huge outbreaks that we've seen on college campuses over the last, during the fall session, uh, the partying problem among young people, well, those are all things that we have to address as we begin to try to open up schools for this year. So I think there is a chance that many schools can come out of the virtual world and go back into the classroom, but it's going to take a lot of uh, very hard work. And teachers are a precious commodity. It's very, very important that we protect them uh, because they have such an impact on future generations. So uh, I can't emphasize enough the importance of, of protecting our teachers uh, and other staff uh, when we bring kids back into schools. With Halloween and other holidays coming soon, any advice for Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas to stay safe? We've talked about that a little bit. Again, trying to not have large groups. Try not to have people that are at high risk, the older people. I know it's great to have your uh, older family members there for these holidays. They, they particularly enjoy them, but they are at very high risk. So this might not be the time that you have the elderly aunt or the aging grandparent to come and be with the whole family. Keep the group small. Keep it socially distant. Wear masks. You know, Halloween, you can do a lot of stuff out on the front lawn, not trick-or-treating, but you can have a lot of stuff where you can have a display. I've got some great neighbors that have some incredible stuff they've put up that's entertaining for kids. You can take them on a drive down the street at night and they can see all the different displays. I think trick-or-treating is definitely off the list right now. That just is too high risk uh, and pr people would probably not answer their door hopefully. Uh, but we can have the holidays. You know, people had Thanksgiving and Christmas during the Blitz and, or sorry, well they didn't have Thanksgiving in England, but they had Christmas during the Blitz in England and they, you know, they, that went on for many months and the war of course went on for many years. So under adverse conditions, people can still celebrate and understand the importance of holidays. But I think for this year, again, paying attention, we are in the middle of a pandemic with a highly infectious, very, very dangerous virus, and you just don't want to give it to a family member. So once again, I want to thank uh, all, for all of you that support the hospital. Uh, Huntington is an amazing place. I've spent my whole life there. I literally was born there. My mother was born there. And uh, I did my training there. It is an incredible place to work. The uh, staff, the uh, administration, uh, the people that make up that building are amazing. They are doing incredible work. And I want to give a final shout out to the nurses because they have done an amazing job during a very, very difficult time. Every day they go in there and they take care of those patients and they do it with great heart and compassion. And I, we really owe them a huge, huge thank you. So uh, shout out to them for all the great work that they do. Thank you very much.